Okay. How do I know if everybody is listening? Okay. Shoot for ideal consistency over accuracy. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. So, okay. should I just go now? Go ahead Start. And start. Yeah. Everybody ready? Awesome. Hi everybody. I'm Eduardo Angel and we will be talking for the next hour or so about color and how consistency is more important than accuracy when we're shooting video. So I hope many of you are photographers already shooting video and if not you will soon and this presentation is specifically targeted for you guys. So let's start with this. Color. We all have a pretty good idea of what color is and I mean we all understand what color uh, uh, is about but what we often forget is how color is different for different people in different cultures for example wisdom if we think of the word wisdom or the concept wisdom it's kind of interesting that in Japanese and Hindu cultures they relate that word with the color purple while well, it's brown for Native American cultures and it's blue for Eastern European cultures so if you are doing a project if you're shooting a film uh, let's say a documentary and you are trying to communicate uh, like this elder um, like person and like uh, con con convey this wisdom uh, in his in his uh, scenes, like we should think about what kind of art design are we gonna use? What kind of color are we gonna use? Purple, brown, blue? Well, it's gonna mean different things in different cultures. Now, an easy one, or so we think, love. What color is love? And in this part of the world, we understand love as red or pink. It depends. So yes, it is it is red in the Western world, but yet it is green in the in Hindu cultures, yellow in Native American cultures, and blue in African cultures. So just think about this like uh, slide for a second. If you're using a blue color palette, a very cool to color palette, you could be talking about wisdom for Eastern Europeans, Eastern Europeans, or uh, love for African cultures. Okay. So colors and movies, cartoons, these are Pixar movies and as we all know because we have seen pretty much all of them, especially The Incredibles, one of my favorite movies ever, they are very saturated, the reds are super red, the yellows are super yellow and we have Dick Tracy and all these movies that uh, are based on cartoons uh, that obviously are super saturated, I like to call them more real than reality. So you would think, okay, so cartoons are super saturated, but not always. How about Sin City, a Robert Rodriguez film that is based also on a comic book, and it's completely the opposite. It's very desaturated, it's very contrasty, it's kind of black and white, but it has the sepia, interesting warm tones. And so, okay, these are both cartoons or based on cartoons, but uh, they are very different, of course. Okay, now two very um, common examples. The Matrix, I think that we all have seen many, many times The Matrix, and some of you might have seen Limitless. I, I highly recommend the movie, especially the intro sequence, which is absolutely insane, shot with like 12 red cameras at the same time. Um, but we're talking about color. And in The Matrix, if you are watching the movie, you nobody's going to tell you this, but we 
understand, somehow our brain understands that all the scenes that take place within the matrix have a green tint. And conversely, all the scenes that are outside the matrix have a blue tint, which is uh, fascinating, I find. Now, for limitless, the, there is no like inside or outside the matrix, but the movie is about this guy, this character who finds a pill. And if we believe that we humans use 10% of our brain, let's make believe that the pill allows him to use 100% of his brain. So he's like a super genius. And when he's taking the pill, or before he takes the pill, everything is greedy and dark and greenish and like well, the, like the image you see on the top left. And after taking the pill, when he's under the influence of the, or under the effect of the pill, everything is brighter, warmer, and more saturated. So again, no one is telling us this, but we understand the cue, the color cue. And at some point, we actually have a POV, a point of view from the character's perspective. And then we understand that everything that is brighter and more saturated is, well, he is under the influence of the pill. And then when it's not, then he's off. House of Cards, one of uh, your probably favorite uh, TV shows. What you might have not noticed consciously is that it's, it follows a very consistent color treatment. Almost always, the background is warmer than the foreground. So the background is always yellower and the background, the foreground is always bluer or cooler. And this is a pretty consistent color treatment. There are many theories on why this is happening from politics to psychology to all kinds of things. So it's up to you to decide why this is, why this is uh, being done this way. But the fact is that it, it, keeps, it keeps the viewer engaged in, it has a consistent look. It, it's, a, it, it's a continuity. Uh, in, there is continuity in terms of, in terms of color across the, the series. Two other movies that I recommend watching to better understand the role of color and how it affects us as viewers uh, is Traffic by Steven Soderbergh, which is a, a very interesting movie and happens like the, 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 the story is developed in Mexico and the US. And once again, no one tells us these, but while the story is happening in Mexico, then all the scenes are green and yellow, warmer, and when the scenes are happening in the US, the scenes are cooler and bluer. And the, the poster for the movie reflects that, the blue sky and the warmer um, like cars and sand. And Three Kings, which is kind of uh, like a comedy approach to a war movie where the colors are also super saturated, super contrasty, much warmer, and as I mentioned before, more real than reality. That's another interesting movie to watch in terms of color movement. But this is not new. As you can see, this color wheel developed in 1980, uh, a while back, by Mr. Robert Plutchik. And uh, he basically mapped out the different colors and the, uh, to, that communicate different emotions. I'm not sure how many people follow these to the letter, and I'm not sure if this applies all across different cultures and different uh, different countries, but um, the fact is that it's it's there and you can definitely uh, use it to your advantage and at least test wh what happens when you're applying a different color treatment to 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 your projects. But those are Hollywood movies. They have millions of dollars. They have all the time in the world. So what about real people with real budgets? real life challenges. So very quickly, just getting this out of the way in case you are just uh, getting started with video. Exposure, the exposure triangle we know very well in photography. I'm sure all of you are photographers. ISO aperture shutter speed, the exposure triangle. That's all good and great. The change, the, one of the big changes uh, when shooting video is that shutter speed is no longer uh, a factor. Like basically, you cannot really use shutter speed to control exposure. 
the shutter speed is directly related to your frame rate and that rule of thumb is twice your frame rate is pretty much a good shutter speed to start with. So for example, if you're shooting at 30 frames per second, you want to start with a 60th of a second as your shutter speed and then you set it and forget it. So you don't play with the shutter speed to control exposure and we all know that ISO has limitations and aperture has more limitations as well. So what do we do to control our exposure if we cannot use the shutter speed to control it? So neutral density filters, ND filters that will cut down uh, exposure and you have these variable ND filters uh, that you attach to the lens and I love them because you, like, you just put one and then you have from one up to eight different stops in a single filter or you can use a plus two or plus four or you might be using cameras that have built-in ND filters uh, or you can use uh, 4x4 or any other size ND filters in front of your lens. So that's great for exposure but what happens when you're using an ND filter? Well, the light meter, while it's really important, it's inaccurate because the light meter doesn't know what kind of exposure setting do you have in front of the lens, like where is the ND filter um, yeah, positioned. So the light meter is great when you don't have that, but if you are using an ND filter, most of the time you will be using one when shooting exteriors, then the light meter becomes somewhat irrelevant. And let's dig into more into the, the camera profiles. And um, these are, uh, this is a Canon uh, menu, but it applies to any Sony or Panasonic or Nikon camera. And you all have seen these standard portrait landscape neutral all that and we don't really pay attention to these since most of us are shooting raw and this doesn't really matter it's not applied but if we are shooting jpegs then this is really important because the picture style in this case the camera profile gets baked is baked into the the image is baked into the jpeg the thing with video is that these settings are also baked into the footage. So we need to be very careful choosing early on what kind of camera profile are we going to use. And this is especially important if you are using more than one camera at a time. So having, for example, one camera on standard and another camera, B cam, on portrait, well, you can guess what's going to happen. It's going to be a post-production nightmare to try to match one to the other. Flat profiles provide more flexibility during post. Basically, it's not, it's not really technically raw, but it gives us more dynamic range and it will give uh, us more latitude to play later on with colors. And let me just go here to the next one. And Technicolor, a while back, Technicolor uh, developed this scene style setting. I'm not sure if it's only for Canon cameras. I, I forget because it was a while back. And it was good. And all it was doing was like minimizing the contrast to minus four and lowering the saturation to minus two. So that, that, was, that was fine, but it, it still I felt it was somewhat incomplete. The, the, the challenge here is that most of us, we, we're going to be shooting with more than one camera at a time. So let's say our camera A is, in this case, a Sony FS7, just to say something, okay? And then our, our camera B is going to be an A7S or something like that. So same brand, different models, and obviously slightly different settings, even though in this case, you can select the same exact camera profile, the, the same S-Log for two cameras. That's kind of rare and you still need to make sure that you select the right one. Or let's make believe that you select your camera A is a Canon, as, let's say a C100 Mark II or something like that. And then as a camera B, you have a Nikon or a DSLR or a GH4 in this case. So obviously in this case, different brands, different models. Uh, so they will not match. So this is a good situation, this is a good uh, example when a flat profile might be helpful. At least you're starting from, they're not going to be the same flat profile, but at least you're starting from a 
kind of like a green apple and a red, red apple, not apple and pineapple. And camera C, most of us use um, GoPros as C cams or for doing time lapses or, or all kinds of uh, awesome shots. So that will definitely not match uh, either A, B uh, on the left or A, B on the right. Okay, so standard Technicolor uh, and like uh, whatever whatever you're using right now. The flat profiles uh, we didn't have access to these profiles unless we were using a very expensive camera. In in, in some in instances, sixty seventy thousand dollar camera. Now today we have access to Panasonic V Log, to Canon C Log, and to Sony S Log for under five thousand dollars, which might sound like a lot, but compared to 70, it is not. And um, we should take that to our advantage, use that uh, to our advantage. So again, flat profiles provide more flexibility during post-processing, but usually requires not only more time, but more knowledge, and more time and knowledge is usually uh, relates to more money. So this is an example of a project we shot earlier this year for, for Panasonic when they announced the, the V-Log and anamorphic feature on the GH4. So this is both. This is an anamorphic, uh, anamorphic footage shot in V-Log and this is the before and after, uh, before grading on the right and after grading on the left. And this is another example of the anamorphic footage before grading, a flat profile, and then after grading. So more contrasty and more colorful. If you want to read more about the whole project and the challenges uh, of shooting anamorphic with a tiny camera like the GH4, you can visit that link, uh, Anamorphic Lessons on Bitly, and the, in the final uh, video is also there available. So moving on, external monitors. When you, we are using a flat profile, it's extremely hard to make sure to confirm that everything is sharp because there's no contrast. That's the definition of flat. So I strongly recommend using an external monitor and even better if it's an external monitor slash recorder. The Atomos Shogun, the one at the bottom left, is one of my favorite tools nowadays because I can record directly into it to an, a solid state drive. I have basically not unlimited recording time because the solid state is is limited, but 480 gigs or 240 gigs um, will last a long time. I can also shoot directly into ProRes 422, and then I avoid any transcoding later on, if uh, depending on the software I'm using to, to cut. But besides that, you have a lot of different tools like scopes and waveforms and every and, and many other features uh, that are extremely handy to make sure that your exposure is right and that the that your white balance is correct when you're shooting uh, flat profiles. And next, oops, sorry. I'm gonna go, sorry. So, Time is money, color checker video, color checker pass for video. This, because time is money, I'm always looking for shortcuts, not to compromise quality, but shortcuts to save time. And which uh, sometimes, sometimes there aren't any. But in this case, I have found that the, that the brand new color checker video and the color checker passport video are, are saving me a lot of time in post with little, very little effort. So let's take a look at a quick video um, where, where um, x right explains what these tools are about and then we can continue.
So I see some comments here that the volume on the video was uh, too low, so my apologies for that. I, I have the volume maxed out and I can hear it very well. But you can uh, check it out on Xrite's website if you're uh, curious and it's totally worth uh, the couple of minutes. And um, so the, the color checker video, the, the front of it is, is really simple. It has, as you can see, the, your uh, large gray levels, your chromatic colors, your skin tones. So it's, it's really well designed uh, for, for, for studio applications, I believe. Um, uh, for on location, I prefer the passport, the color checker passport video uh, simply because it's more portable, it's smaller and it has a plastic case. And most of you are going to be uh, already owned a color checker passport for, for photography. So let's talk briefly about options for post-production. How can we, what, what do we have in terms of post for color and how can we actually use these tools? And on a very recent assignment, I was uh, shooting a, like a real estate a building in, in New York and the client wanted a similar look to Mad Men, the TV show. Okay, so, well, I, I, wa I have watched Mad Men, but like not at that level. So we had to do some research on how does Mad Men look? What, what's the color palette? What's the saturation? What, are, what, what is the color treatment overall? And then we found um, some interesting information about the set design thanks to Google. And based we, well, so based on this information, we definitely wanted to shoot a flat profile so we could tweak the color and match this look for, for the client. This is what the client wanted. So also, as part of our research, I really like this website that very few people know for some reason, is shotonwhat.com. And you can type there uh, I mean, you can search by, by many different criteria, but one of them is by film stock or by, by, the, by the movie title, in this case, a TV series. So we searched Mad Men and uh, found out that it was shot on film. And as you can see at the bottom, it was shot um, with Kodak, the um, 5205 film and 5219 film. So, okay, that was a great piece of information that will come in handy in a, in a few minutes. Um, so just keep that in mind. Kodak 5205, Mad Men, okay, cool. So in terms of uh, solutions and post-production and specifically software solutions for, for color grading, uh, well, the, the, the one that, that it's really making a huge wave is DaVinci Resolve. Uh, mostly because it's, it's really good for color, um, for color grading, but at the same time because Blackmagic, who actually owns DaVinci, um, keeps adding features to the point that you could use only this piece of software to cut your entire project. So it's now a complete NLE and you can just do everything from import to delivery from, with this, with this uh, software. The best part is that it comes in two flavors, a $1,000 version, the studio version, and a free version. So if you're just getting started, I would strongly recommend that you download a copy of DaVinci Resolve 12 and get your feet wet with these. This is not a light version, and the limitations, the differences between the free version and the $1,000 version are really insignificant for most people. The, 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 the added features for the thousand dollars are like super professional features. So you can absolutely do everything and it doesn't have any watermarks or anything like that. So DaVinci Resolve 12 is a really good solution right now in terms of software. Another one that I have been using for a while is Red Giant's Magic Bullet Looks. And it's a standalone application, but it's also a plugin for Final Cut and Premiere Pro. And I like it because it comes with many different uh, looks or presets, and it's it's a it's a very fast way to apply something, especially in pre-production, not only in post-production, but in pre-production, and see if the mood that we're going after is working or not working for us. And it will help us, uh, specifically me as a director of photography, to understand my lighting 
uh, strategy to better to better understand my lighting strategy. So this is a cool one, and there are a gazillion plugins for Final Cut 10. So just whatever whatever you're using, uh, just if it's working, just keep using it. Uh, I prefer to use uh, other plugins and I, I prefer to use Adobe Premiere Pro but that's just my personal taste. Film Convert is a nice one because it not only allows you to apply presets and looks and lots but it mimics uh, the, the, the film grain. That's why Film Convert and um, converts your footage into a film stock and it also comes as a standalone application and as a plugin for Final Cut and Premiere Pro. So that's that's also pretty cool. And this is the screenshot of the standalone, and this is the screenshot for the plugin. It's it's really good, but right now I'm on a, I'm in love with something else. All of you are probably familiarized with Lightroom, like most of you, if not all, are photographers. And the develop module that you know by heart, most of you have been using Lightroom since version one as I have and like we are all used to these settings so all the the basic panel the temperature the exposure the highlights the vibrance all those things that we already know by heart have been applied literally copied and pasted to Adobe Premiere Pro in a new panel called the Lumetri panel and that's what I'm uh, I'm very excited about this because finally I'm able to very quickly color correct my projects without having to go to Speed, Speedgrade or DaVinci or any other software applications. I can do everything within Premiere Pro and I don't have to really learn anything like new. Like all the settings from uh, the same UI from Lightroom and all the settings from Lightroom are here. And as you can see, the same exposure, contrast, and saturation are here and they're exactly the same sliders. So if you don't want to use the Lumetri panel, inside Premiere Pro you can search for look and it comes loaded with looks by organized by camera and each camera has, as you can see here, easily 15, 20 different looks. We'll, we'll look at a couple of them side by side. So you don't even have to I mean, I don't recommend that, but if you're like doing something very quick, you can take your footage, apply a look, and boom, out. So going back to Mad Men and our Kodak 5205 film stock, guess what? If I go to the Lumetri panel, one of the looks on the Lumetri panel is Kodak 5205, the bottom one. And so I can actually look, m match the footage to the same exact film stock. Before we get jump into a, a, a quick demo, I wanted to mention that one of the huge advantages of these Lumetri color panel in Adobe Premiere Pro is that we can tweak our settings. Let's say uh, for this specific assignment and this specific client, I tweak my settings for to match my my vlog footage and match the Kodak 5205 look. So I can create a look which is just the same thing as a preset in Lightroom. And all of you know what a preset is. It's basically a shortcut that we can quickly like apply or batch apply to other images. And we can take with us. So if I'm working on another computer, I can simply I mean, I keep my, my, my looks and my presets, all my settings for Lightroom and Premiere Pro uh, on Dropbox. And then anywhere I am in the world, I have access to the same settings, regardless of the computer I'm using. So this is super, super cool. And I can also import specifically to this Atomos Shogun recorder and external monitor, I can upload up to eight different user-defined lots. Basically, I can take and tweak my my profile until I'm I'm happy, until I until the client is happy, really, uh, with the Mad Men look, and I I can export that as a .dot look or .dot cube file format. Then I can simply import or uh, upload the .dot cube file format with Mad Men dot cube file format into my Atomos Shogun. And then when I'm on location, when I'm recording, I can simply 
um, view the footage with that lot applied. Now it's not recording with the lot baked into the footage and that's important to understand. I'm still recording a flat with a flat profile. I'm still recording a V-log or C-log or S-log, whatever, whatever uh, flavor I'm using. But I can see and expose properly for that specific look. So a quick demo. Quick demo. I'm going to make a quick stop and make sure that I don't know, no one is asking something urgent. Uh, Take a look at my chat window here and let's jump into this. Why is this thing beeping? Okay, so quick demo. I hope this is you're learning something. Here is my my footage in Premiere Pro and I already imported what I needed uh, so we have a pretty good idea of my workflow. So this is my MO. This is my standard practice for pretty much every shoot I, I work on. I set the camera, set my exposure and then boom, five seconds placing the color checker passport, in this, in this case the color checker passport video, in front of the camera for five seconds. Okay. And now the other side of the color checker passport for another five seconds and I'm ready to roll. So think about this. Five seconds each is ten seconds. Honestly, it's going to save you hours three, four, five hours in post later on. So this looks really cool and this is the standard profile. It looks nice. It was a beautiful day, kind of like impossible day. It was like not too windy, not too cold, beautiful light, no clouds, everything like it was perfect. That's typical. That's not typical. And and um, so in this case, I probably get, could get away shooting a, a standard profile but that's not that's not typical this is this flat profile and look at the difference between the standard profile let's call this this is the standard profile and look at here at the flat profile so again I'm just rolling again and then five seconds with the flat profile five seconds uh, sorry, with the color checker passport, five seconds with the other side of the color checker passport uh, with all the targets and then I roll. In this case, in this case I'm going um, east to, no, west to east, left to right. You see Manhattan, you see the Brooklyn Bridge and then you see the Manhattan Bridge. And then I'm going back and I'm going east to west, in this case right to left and then you still see the same bridge and then you see the FDR and Central Park back there. Okay, but how do we actually use this thing? So how do we actually use this uh, color, um, the color um, checker passport video? So here's how you use it. First way, well, this is my 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 procedure basically. I under effects panel and bottom left, I look for fast, and on I find my fast color corrector, and then I'm gonna apply this effect. I'm gonna just make it larger so you have it here, and then so you know you can drag and drop the effect, or you can double click the effect with the clip selected, and that also applies the effect. Okay. Now I'm going to, on the top left, I'm going here to my white balance tool. I grab my eyedropper and boom. And now my white balance is accurate, it's, uh, it's proper. I'm going to the second footage, the second clip, and I'm going to look for way. So I can find my three-way color corrector. I can drag and drop or I can double click. And all I need to do is check my eyedropper for the shadows and guess where I'm gonna click obviously the blacks I'm gonna click on my midtones and I click on my gray and I click on the highlights and I click on the white 
done and done because it's a very flat profile and it was properly exposed or somewhat properly exposed you will see in a second uh, it doesn't change that much but it will change drastically depending on the lighting conditions and especially if you're using uh, if you're shooting under mixed lighting situations now this is my real footage this is my actual footage day so how do I apply those changes super easy I select the first clip I correct it and I command C or uh, on, on Apple and then I'll just paste my attributes and it's gonna show me that I'm applying the fast color corrector to this clip which means I'm applying the proper white balance to this clip I go to my second clip I'm gonna command C copy I will go back to my footage and then I can paste attributes and then you can see here I'm applying my three-way color corrector here okay now in terms of uh, sequencing or in terms of continuity I strongly recommend fixing each clip individually and then matching all the shots in a sequence otherwise it's it's like a never-ending uh, story because it, it you, you will tweak one and then tweak another and then tweak the other one and, and you're moving uh, up and down depending on the on the footage so I strongly recommend starting with these very basic settings and so to recap the the steps are correcting the individual shots for proper contrast so making sure that the blacks are black and the whites are white then step number two would be uh, removing unwanted color cast so proper white balance I did in this case I, I demo the white balance first and uh, contrast second it's the same then three I would adjust hue and saturation four would be a review shot to shot consistency we haven't done that yet and then five we will add our own look to match the story okay so let's make believe that we're very happy with this because we are and then let's go here and on Premiere Pro if you're not seeing the Lumetri color panel you can go under workspaces and you can find the Lumetri color and Lumetri scopes and let's call for those scopes so this is my panel and the Lumetri scopes are super awesome on the left we have the waveform Luma this one and it's a black and white waveform indicating us the exposure of this specific clip we want the highlights to be right below 100 and the shadows to be right above zero so we want in this case we are we could push it higher and lower and the second scope this one is the RGB parade the one on the right and this will show us how far off are we in terms of white balance so if we have a specific um, hue that we uh, let's say if we have more red or more blue or more green so let's start with the with the first one with the waveform Luma the one on the left right here so I can go with the exposure but as you know exposure in Lightroom it's a global setting so it's affecting the whole clip at once and I don't really have much control of my highlights and shadows so what I prefer to do is go to my curves and here you have white red green and blue and here I can adjust my shadows I can make the blacker the blacks blacker and here I can make my whites wider and I can go way higher here now we're talking now I'm in the range of 80 to 20 and I could go back a little bit but I know I'm gonna be applying a lot later on so I know I want to stay within that range it's, it basically comes from experience uh, that I know that I'll need that later on and next let's tweak our colors it's pretty good uh, in terms of uh, uh, our white balance but let's go let's go crazy for a second and, and let's see let's see the difference let's say I'm taking this blue and I'm just applying it to my shadows well you see what happens you see the blue going much lower and much darker 
than the green and the red. And if let's let's make believe that this was how I shot it for whatever reason, I used the wrong white balance or a wrong Kelvin preset or something, then I can go back and tweak these and match my other colors, my red and my green in this case. Okay, so again, I strongly recommend fixing the individual shots first and then applying your uh, creative look. So what's next? At this point, we can move to the, that's the basic correction, and then we can just like continue working here on contrast and shadows and whites and all that. But we don't have time for that. So let's jump into the creative panel. And then here, under the creative panel, we have, um, actually, let's go back to back basic correction, input lot, and I'm gonna show you something super incredible. You have all these camera lots, and a lot is a lookup table. And you have Alexa, you have Canons, you have Nikons, you have even red cameras. For some reason, uh, the the flat profile, the V-log on Panasonic looks or works extremely well with the Alexa Rec 709 profile. So if I apply this, it's a little too contrasty for my taste, but I really like the colors. I like how juicy everything is. So uh, as you can see on my waveform, uh, we're kind of clipping, not yet, but we're about to clip our highlights. And uh, we can definitely go lower on the shadows. So I'm gonna just open up the shadows a little bit and I'm gonna bring those highlights down a little bit. And we can do that with curves, obviously, or we can do that with our sliders, just like in Lightroom. So that's pretty cool. But what if I wanted that 5205 Kodak look from Mad Men? Well, this is where you could apply that. And so it happens that the Kodak 5205 is here also. And this is how it would look if I shot this on film, on Kodak film. And to compare, okay, I hope you're impressed and how fast and how easy this is. And I'm gonna open my shadows and I'm gonna bring my highlights down a little bit. And again, we're not spending too much time working on this. Oh, too much. But if I'm happy with this setting, I'll just go to the next clip that technically I have fixed before or corrected before for my white balance and my contrast. And then I can just copy everything and then paste and because it was shot, so I'm applying the fast color corrector, the three-way color corrector, then the Lumetri color, everything at once, and then it matches the same exact look. So I'm going here from left to right, and then I'm gonna jump here from right to left. Someone is asking questions, so let me see. Uh, Derek is asking if you can use the Passport in Final Cut Pro the same way, and the answer is yes, sir, you can. Absolutely the same exact thing. And um, and uh, Tobias is asking, is there banding in the sky? Well, not on my end probably over the webinar, over the go to webinar, but not on my end. Also, keep in mind that we're looking at the fourth of the resolution here. I can go to full resolution and it might change for you, but the laptop is, is gonna be hurting. This is 4K uh, footage. Um, so, no, I don't see it on my end. Uh, any other questions? Where are these Lumetri looks on Premiere Pro? Uh, Matt is asking. You go to window, and then right here, Lumetri Color will open the Lumetri panel, and Lumetri Scopes will open this window. And you have many more to choose from, but we don't have time for like to cover all of them. These are the two main ones that I use, the Waveform Luma, uh, the one on the left, and the RGB Parade, the one on the right. This one is mostly for exposure, and this one is mostly for, for color balance, for white balance. Um, and then let's move on to the next 
and final part of this webinar because we're running out of time and then we can take some questions. This is the standard, uh, no, sorry, this is the, let me go back, make sure that I'm not saying what it's not true. This is the Lumetri panel and this is a, a very quick correction with the Lumetri, Lumetri panel to match the client look, to, to match the madman look that he wanted. Okay, that's all good. And this is how film convert would look like. So it's too dark for my taste. Uh, it's too too contrasty. But again, it's just applying the profile, the 5205 uh, Kodak film profile, and not doing a single thing to it. So as a starting point, it's pretty good, I think. This, so you remember, this is the flat profile. So you refresh your memory on how different it looks, uh, the flat profile from the camera. And this is what I, I, I really like this. If we look for under effects, we, I'm going to look for look. I'm going to look for look. And all the cameras, check this out, so many different options here. 7D, C300, C500, GoPro, I mean, it's, it's, it's just crazy. All this is built, is, this is by default. This, is, this comes with the software for free. There are, these are not paid plugins or additional things that you have to install. This comes with Premiere Pro CC 2015. But, so if I open the Canon C300 and I look for the Noir 1965 profile, what I would like to show you is that the same profile looks very different depending on the camera. So this is the Noir 1965 here, the, the Noir 1965 profile for the Canon C300, working from the same footage, right? It's not that this was shot with C300 and this one was shot with Alexa. It's uh, working with the same profile. But I don't like the C300 uh, look for this specific footage for this specific uh, 1965 Noir but I love the look of the Alexa 60, 19, Noir's 1965 with this. It might be a little too contrasty. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna open the shadows a bit. I'm picking the wrong uh, clip. I'm gonna open the shadows a bit, but I really, 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 really like the, the look of this. What's going on with my clip? Freaking out. So. This is the flat profile. We have more questions. Let's go back to the questions. Are these options available on Sony Vegas Pro? I don't know, uh, Jay Chin. I don't know. I don't use Sony Vegas Pro, but um, uh, in terms of the color checker, you can use it the same way. I'm not sure if there are looks or presets in Sony Vegas. I haven't used it. And um, what else is here? Do we have to save a camera profile previews with the color checker passport as we do in Lightroom? No, you do not. Uh, you just, uh, I'm, uh, Francisco is asking if we have to save the camera profile previously. So no, you, you just don't. You can save it, but you don't have to do it previous to this. And the way to save it is, let's say I love, because I do, this uh, Film Noir 1965 look uh, on, Panasonic footage but using the Alexa profile and if I'm happy with this I can simply go here and then I can export the dot look so I can take this look with me and then apply it to another Premiere Pro project on another computer or I can export the dot cube profile so I can upload that to my Atomos Shogun and when I'm uh, shooting my next uh, film noir uh, project, I can actually see what it's going to look like and I can make lighting decisions on set, accurate lighting decisions uh, on set based on the look, even though I'm going to be recording the flat profile. And I can also save the preset as my Roger Dickens, uh, the man who wasn't there, Coen Brothers profile, and then uh, also use it on another computer or share it with the client or with an editor or uh, so on. So to finish this, uh, in terms of additional resources, because I mean, obviously there's a lot more to cover uh, in the topic of uh, color, 
uh, is uh, xrightvideo.com. Uh, the, I, I, li I really like this page. They have done a really good job um, with educational content, with videos, how to use these um, new tools, and uh, they have a great example uh, and the behind the scenes of that project is also worth uh, watching. And more additional resources, I have two courses on lynda.com specifically designed for photographers transitioning uh, to video, it's called film, Filmmaking Essentials and Filmmaking on Location. Uh, I also have two more courses um, on the whys specifically, not so much about the how to compose and how to move the camera, but why cinematic composition is slightly different than uh, composing for stills and why moving the camera is important for your video productions. And lastly, I have two more courses on uh, lighting and one is the one on the left is why you should light even if the camera goes to 200 million ISO why lighting is really important to tell the story just as color is as important and uh, another one and more practical course is corporate and documentary video lighting so the my website eduardoangel.com is always um, I'm always trying to push content mostly on things uh, we learn uh, mistakes we make and things we try that don't work for us or work for us and that we find interesting so um, as you can see the third one the third post uh, from about two three weeks ago is about uh, testing different profiles on the Panasonic GH4 versus the vlog profile and that's the website and um, that's it for this webinar so I'll be happy to take uh, a few more a few more questions um, yes two things uh, the main takeaways from this webinar so that's a great question first the main the, the, the number one is I, w I hope you understand why when shooting video consistency is even more important than accuracy and this this I hope this conveys the uh, or delivers the point and number two uh, it would be uh, that it is important to understand how to manipulate color it, it is important to understand how the, the software works but even more important is to understand how color can manipulate the viewer and enhance our stories I think that that's the that, that's the most important the more important lesson and uh, Kevin is asking what version of Premiere are you showing today that's Premiere Pro CC 2015 and Matt is asking me to let you know that a, a link to the recording of today's webinar will be sent within 24 hours to everyone who registered for today's webinar and um, I think that's it I, I, any more any more questions Matt Sandra anyone all right well right on track two minutes to one um, so thank you very much uh, if you have any additional questions uh, just visit eduardoangel.com and uh, just shoot me an email or you can find me on Twitter at, at 